So the lecture uh, topic today is from pilgrimage to civic pride, <clears throat> late medieval cities and cathedrals. So the 1000 year, the 1000 year between about five, the year 500 to about the year 1500 is known as the medieval period in Europe, right? So from the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the Western Roman Empire, which happened in the year 476, so roughly 500. That is the fall of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and then in late 14th century and early 15th century, you know, around 1400, 1500, that, that century <clears throat> is known as a Renaissance. So between the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of Renaissance, that long period of roughly, you know, a thousand a year, you know, 900 to about 1000 a year, that period is known as medieval period. The two end of the medieval period <clears throat> in architecture is classicism. You know, Roman architecture, we know it followed Greek and the Greco-Roman architecture during medieval period is referred to as pagan, but now we call them classical, right? Why do we call them classical? It is because after Renaissance, you know, Renaissance, is a reaction to medievalism and going back to classical. That's why it's called the Renaissance, right? Revive, revive the classical tradition, rediscovery of um, humanism that is a characteristic of you know, Greek culture, humanity. <clears throat> During the entire long medieval period of roughly a thousand year, humanism somehow is under the authority of the divine power of the church. And that is something um, those Renaissance humanists, um, great scholars, artists, scientists, they try to get back. And that would be a top the topic <clears throat> that Professor Brothers is going to cover on Friday. So we are just looking at the European architecture sandwiched in between the fall of the Roman Empire and the return of the classical in Renaissance. <clears throat> we looked at part of that history. You know, we looked at the early Christian architecture uh, in Europe that um, <clears throat> during the period, you know, in the, in the fourth century to the seventh century, we looked at um, a sample of Byzantine architecture. <clears throat> and those are all before the year 1000. And um, so today's lecture is going to be focused on the late medieval period late medieval period refer to the period roughly between 1000 and, and 1400, right? So this late imperial period, uh, late uh, medieval period, <clears throat> quite different from the, uh, the early period. But throughout the um, medieval period, European society um, was characterized by the prevailing of feudalism what is a feudalism? Feudalism is the lack of central uh, governance. We know that during the um, <clears throat> during the um, uh, classical period, um, the Roman world had a you know power center, and very efficiently governing the entire you know huge context, a uh, huge um, continent of Europe, but in the, in the medieval period, feudalism that in, in which 
political power is decentralized and localized. So there were many, many local rulers because of the chaos created by the, um, the barbarian um, invasion and barbarian in quotation mark, right? <clears throat> the invasion of the God the Gothic people, the Germanic people, the Vandals, and uh, the Berber, um, the, the Berbers, uh, etc. So those people who originally lived to the northern border and eastern border of the Roman Empire, they came to dominate the former land um, of Western Europe and founded those, um, <clears throat> you know, in independent countries um, like like France, um, Italy, right, and, and Germany, um, and each of those countries were decentralized, not um, united, unified at all. Uh, for example, there were, there were the states of Burgundy, uh, states of Saxon, and, um, um, you know, the, the Anglo-Saxon um, states in the Great Britain. So they were all broken up, um, smaller states, and each smaller states, um, the power were not centralized in the hand of the king at all. So there were many, many smaller uh, local lords. <clears throat> so there was a decentralization of power during the medieval period. And um, <clears throat> so there were three centers of power, um, which were much localized, but somehow became some kind of unifying forces in the medieval period, the royalty. Um, some of those royalty, like the French king, um, you know, managed to, to consolidate a, lar a larger territory. <clears throat> um, or the English king, um, the, they were managed to, to hold on to power, to have assume authority over um, the areas um, around the capital. Um, and then there were the nobilities, uh, those are local lords uh, in the rank of duke or marquis, um, you know, or barons. So those local nobility, they acknowledge the authority of the royalty, however, under within their estate, within their domain, they had absolute power and the king and the royalty somehow didn't have control of that, um, their, the local uh, lords at all. And finally, there is a church. So the church uh, gradually became the center because they control spirituality, even though in the beginning they had no secular power, but the church became more and more powerful, especially the, the papacy um, <clears throat> with the capital uh, in Vatican, um, the Vatican uh, papal states gradually was formed um, and it controlled bigger and a bigger land. And because they had a spiritual um, privilege, uh, they had um, fight with the royalty, with the nobility in terms of taxation, you know, who had the right to, <clears throat> to, to, to tax um, the land. And it's during the medieval period, it, it is off, very often that the church won um, <clears throat> because they had the power to excommunicate the king, uh, which means you know, to declare that the king was not a Christian. And in the medieval period, that was really a serious um, accusation. Um, some kings had to uh, walk hundreds of miles to go to <clears throat> meet the Pope to beg for pardon so that they can be allowed to return to, um, to the Christian religion uh, to be a rightful ruler of their kingdom. So the church um, had great power and eventually it became a state um, on its own right to control large uh, land and had great authority. But <clears throat> in general, the power were um, decentralized, you know, royalty, nobility, and the churches. There was no singular central power like during the Roman time, um, where, you know, Rome, um, it's 
emperors and senates had um, authority over the entire Europe. So with decentralized power, um, the economy was agrarian, <clears throat> commerce was discouraged because people were tied to the land and long distance um, co commerce trading was not encouraged, especially during the first half of the medieval period, you know, from 500 to 1000, um, commerce was, was not flourishing at all. <clears throat> um, and it is a land, landed uh, economy um, and wealth and status concentrated in landed aristocracy and the church. The church owned large piece of land. Um, <clears throat> political power is based on privileges, rights and obligation between lords and vassal. So there were different ranks of the local lord. Each had authority in their own domain, but they were ranked uh, on the top was the king and under it, you know, there are, um, you know, dukes and marquises and barons, um, etc. They had a different privilege. And um, so there was a hierarchy in those feudal, um, feudal uh, <clears throat> kind of order. Um, and those feudal lords, you know, different rank, they had the right to grant vessels the right to use their land in exchange for service or rent. So even within a feudal domain, the land were cut into even smaller pieces. It's very fragmented, a very fragmented society. And the travel between those different domains, among those different domains were highly controlled. So there were serfs and the serfs um, mostly uh, stay on the fief, right? So those serfs were tied to the fief land, fiefdom. They were not allowed to travel outside the land they were tilting. <clears throat> so most of those population is, are actually those serfs, right? So they cannot travel freely and they were obliged to work uh, the Lord's field in return of protection and the right to lease their fields. So medieval society, especially the early medieval society was a very uh, static, self-sufficient economic and a social system. Movement of people and goods were discouraged. People are fixed to a specific place. That was the, um, in general, the medieval society but more so in the early medieval period before 1000. <clears throat> you know, after 1000, after the 11th century, situations start to change. Um, and uh, there was some re-emergence of city in the 11th century CE. And you know, why 1000? Well, you know, the year 1000 to 2000 um, had a very little meaning um, for non-Christian society, but it had great meaning for Christian society, right? Because there was a promise that Jesus Christ was to come back to found the eternal kingdom. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> you know, in uh, um, usually when the date is getting closer and closer to 1000, 2000, um, among the, belief, the, the, the Christianity population, there was a belief that, you know, Jesus somehow was going to come back very soon probably at the turn of the millennium. So, um, you know, toward 1000, before 1000, people were pretty much preparing for that, for Jesus Christ to come back in the year 1000. 
And you can imagine there was not, the religious atmosphere was much thicker and um, people probably wouldn't um, be too e enthusiastic in building monumental architecture because the, wor the world on earth is going to end very soon and uh, people are getting prepared for entering the, um, the eternal kingdom of Jesus uh, at the turn of the millennium. So in general, <clears throat> um, before 1000, there were very little monumental building, especially on the Western half of, the, of Europe. And uh, that was of course, also partially because of the decline of population in Rome and then the, um, the loss of the, the technical capacity, both in terms of the technological knowledge as well as the lack of central government. So the construction of monumental architecture was not practical before 1000. But after 1000, you know, um, Jesus didn't come. So it seems that people need to wait for another 1000 a year for the second coming. And uh, so a thousand year is a long time. So those rulers, you know, gradually um, the ambition came back construction of monumental architecture uh, gradually resumed after 1000, you know, after the 11th century. And also after the 11th century, um, <clears throat> some of the cities, some of the, you know, as the return of the commerce, some cities became rich, uh, not because of agriculture, but because they were doing business, right? So that kind of a, uh, the um, re-emergence of commerce happening um, after uh, in the 11th century encouraged the accumulation of population on the in the same spot rather rather than dispersing the population um, on the uh, fiefdom. So when they became rich, those so cities started to bargain with their lords. For example, they can bargain with the lord who owned the piece of land, you know, where that, that city is built upon. And they can bargain that, you know, we give you money and you give us, you know, autonomy. So some of those cities start to be granted by the kings and the lords and abbots autonomy. Um, so they can govern themselves and um, in exchange, they pay heavy uh, tax. They, they give their overlord a lot of, a lot of money. So <clears throat> um, the resident in the city became legally free and, um, and they may be granted the right to self-rule um, in exchange for paying rent and a tax. So there was a re-emergence of cities in the 11th century, um, CE. And um, <clears throat> um, the medieval idiom says, the city air make one free, which means even for those um, serfs, if they managed to escape, um, their shackle um, from the fiefdom, they enter the city. They were protected by the autonomy of the city. So city became a nucleus for attraction, attracting a lot of neighboring population. So it starts to uh, create a new culture in the so-called late medieval period after 11th century. And uh, that started the, um, the beginning of a lot of world famous city um, as we uh, see today. For example, the city of Brussels started as a medieval city. Um, this is a map of medieval Brussels, right? Um, and of course today, the city of Brussels um, is a metropolitan 
in, in Belgium. Um, but uh, its core is a medieval medieval city. And there are some medieval city that survived <coughs> almost intact today, like uh, Nerdlingen in Germany that survived um, from the medieval time. So medieval city as emerging from the uh, 11th century encouraged by commerce and the free air of city is characterized by a um, city center that is both secular and sacred. Right? And uh, there is a center for those medieval city. And then there is a boundary. The city are, cities are walled. They had thick wall, they had battlements, they had gates, they had moats to delineate the boundary between the city and the suburb, right? So there is a clear border and there is a, also a clear center. The border defined <clears throat> where is the, uh, the, the area uh, for the self-governance and uh, for uh, freedom from those uh, lord of the fiefdom and the center combined um, Christian religious authority with secular uh, commercial facility, which was the driving force for the creation of these medieval cities. So that center is always the um, for uh, both economic activity and uh, religious activity. So surrounding in the center of those medieval city um, is always a square, a public space, kind of like, of, like the, um, um, the Greek uh, agora. But here, um, both relig religion and commercial activity happened in the, around the same square, right? So in the Greek, classical Greece, the agora was just a secular gov government and the religious center is in the Acropolis, but in medieval city, the same square um, is surrounded by both church cathedrals and a market um, and uh, uh, exchange building and the town hall. So <clears throat> there's a market and um, um, the square is for um, the fairs. <clears throat> um, so medieval city has a characteristic kind of concentric plan focusing on that central commercial square, but also has church um, and religious activity as well as government um, that is the city hall. So you can always see uh, the great um, tower, um, the bell tower um, for the, you know, birth both the religious activity and the commercial activity. Uh, it is usually attached to the city hall. So let's take a look at the um, change of the cities before and after 11th century. Before 11th century, the city of Siena, for example, looks like this. So the city had a lot of towers and the city is only resided by the powerful lords. So there were um, land owning um, rich and powerful families and each of, of them built themselves huge compound, huge mansion and each of those mansions has a watchtower. That watchtower, of, of course, was for protection and for privilege. Someone who can rise that high in their own backyard um, had a lot of power and, and wealth. And of course, that would also allow them to observe the neighboring environment to get a better sense of protection of their home. So, um, <clears throat> But with the rise of a Republican mode of govern government, that city scape 
it's totally changed. Um, in the 13th century, for example, the city of Siena um, was dominated by on, only one tower instead of, you know, a forest of towers. Because in the 13th century, the same city of Siena was a Republican. It was not a feudal um, city anymore. It was, um, <clears throat> it was a home by both the aristocrats and now the aristocrats were commercial aristocrats. They were not land owning kind of a feudal lord anymore. Um, as well as those commoners. So there were small houses for commoners. There were big houses for the elite. So the 13th century Siena was very different uh, from Siena before 1000. And even compared to Siena in the 11th century, it was, it was very different. So this became the typical kind of medieval city where there's just one center with a square, one tower, which is the bell tower attached to the city hall. And uh, in Siena, the case was especially telling. Um, it is um, <clears throat> the, the city square known as the Palazzo Publico. Uh, it has a town hall. It also has church. It has the exchange uh, um, building. It also has a market. Um, the, the city hall housed Siena's Republican government known as the Nine. This is one of the earliest party, political party called the Nine. Novaci rule, the, um, um, the Novaci, uh, the Nine, a political party formed by the noble mercantile banking family. So the city's elites were banking families. They were not land owning um, aristocracy anymore. Uh, <clears throat> the good government and civic pride was expressed in their law, governing the appearance and the maintenance of public space. That law prevented private uh, compound to have a tall tower. So the earlier cityscape was kind of precluded by the law, by the re Republican law. The law required that no tall tower can be built uh, for individual private family. So the city was, was kind of uh, dominated by that expression of civic, civic pride and the civic power, a collective fashion of governance. <clears throat> um, the central square, which is kind of unique, uniquely in a fun shape, um, divided into nine section. And uh, it was, um, uh, previously both a market as well as the ceremonial ground for religious festivals, festivals. And it was bordered by houses of important families and a wealthy merchant. So the privilege of those powerful um, banking uh, elite, um, they can afford to build their mansion uh, right next to the center central square. And uh, um, the central square was divided in like a, you know, a piece of pizza into nine slices, slices representing the nine um, uh, family, the nine, the, the nine um, branches um, of the elites. And um, <clears throat> the architectural unity uh, in, for which the central tower attached to the city hall overlooking um, 
you know, houses of similar size and a similar uh, style was that that uniform was governed by by law um, for the height of buildings and uh, uh, the uh, relatively kind of a uniform style and appearance of the whole city. And the square hosted religious festival as well as the um, uh, the biennial uh, Palio di Siena, which is a secular horse race between representatives um, of the city's 10 wars. So it created a blending of religious activity, entertainment activity, and most importantly, commercial activity in the center of the city, uh, which is very different from the previous social atmosphere of the medieval age. It became a seed for future, for the future of Europe, right? The future of Europe is here. Even though in the 13th century, this is still the minority, but eventually this would become the model for the development of European society. And um, to some extent, the Renaissance, um, the, re the seed for Renaissance is also buried uh, in places like the late medieval Siena. <clears throat> but monumental architecture were still invested uh, in the church building, in religious building. Uh, compared to the churches, cathedrals, the city hall of medieval commercial city were small in size. And that is because during the medieval period, the wealth that can be accumulated by the church uh, overshadows those you know, commercial uh, forces of the bankers. Uh, and there's also a church reform since the 11th century. Uh, and there are you know, three major tendency um, after the 11th century in medieval Europe. The first is the rise of monasticism. And there were a establishment of monastery in, um, in the deliberately chosen um, kind of a rural area, um, not for the comfort of the city or urban life, um, but you know, deliberately choosing a harsh environment, a seclusive environment in the mountain for um, self-cultivation, for meditation, for worship. And that's, that is known as the monasticism or Vita Apostolica that is following the model of the apostles, right? So they establish those monasteries to provide an environment for um, a uh, life that can be followed uh, to, to, you know, to uh, live a life of those apostles. Um, according to them, this is a true example of those apostles. Uh, there's a returning to the root of early Christianity. When Christian Christianity was perse being persecuted, you know, all those leaders and martyrs live in poverty uh, and asceticism, devotion, and celibacy. Uh, and the, um, you know, the current church life, especially uh, those in the um, in Vatican, in the in the you know in in uh, the papacy, were considered somehow um, too much luxury, and um, you know getting um, distracted from the the true uh, Christianity as represented by those apostles, uh, you know in the in the second and third century, uh, for example. So that was one, one uh, significant tendency that contributed to the revival of great architecture 
because a lot of those churches were constructed in the uh, rural area, in the mountains, um, not in the uh, 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 not as part of the uh, you know urban square in the in the center of the cities. A second tendency was the cult of Mary, uh, saints and uh, relics, right? So we know that early Christian architecture were devoted to the Good Shepherd, uh, which is which is Jesus Christ, but somehow in the late medieval period. Merge, uh, Virgin Mary became more and more popular because uh, probably because of the feminine um, image of Mary seems more um, more accessible, uh, more amiable than the aloof Jesus Christ sitting on, you know, first dressed as um, a, a, a shepherd and later as a Lord, um, you know, a mighty Lord. Uh, sitting on a globe. So Mary and saints and relics were worshipped as the intermediate, first as intermediate. Um, they probably can uh, sweet talk to Jesus Christ, um, representing the uh, faithful. Um, and eventually they became so popular a lot, the most great architecture were just dedicated to Mary uh, in, in France, known as Notre Dame, Our Lady, right? So the, the greatest cathedral, um, Gothic cathedral were built for Mary, uh, known as Notre Dame, um, and saints and relics as well. <clears throat> so the change in religious focus from Jesus Christ to Mary, saint and relics triggered um, pilgrimage because the you know there are not that many relics uh, from Jesus Christ but there are occasionally um, you know relics was discovered for you know uh, Saint James or Saint Peter Saint Paul um, Saint Sebastian you know those there were a lot of saint right and their relics were also considered as magical and uh, many churches, not, not many churches can claim that they own a relics from the original cross or Jesus Christ, but a lot of uh, churches can claim that they own a relics of a saint or, or Mary. Um, so that triggered more pilgrimage because in the medieval period, those relics, of course, were considered as magical. Uh, when you get sick, you don't go to a doctor, you go to a church, you kiss the relics and um, the relics was meant to cure the disease or have those miraculous uh, power to fulfill a wish of recovery, right? So pilgrimage was encouraged by, by the you know, widespread of relics, and also the focus of worship to Mary Saint and the relics. Um, and also starting in the 11th century, cruc crusade, crusaders movement was initiated first by the Pope to pacify those feudal Lord. And eventually the also, um, turned to the Muslim who had been in control of the uh, Holy Land of Jerusalem for centuries, um, you know, up to the 11th century. So the Crusaders movement, they um, try to reconquer the Holy Land of Jerusalem, you know, try to take it back from the Muslim to the Christian hand. And both the crusader movement and pilgrimage encouraged movement of people. We know that in before 11th century, there were very little movement. Um, people were tied to the, their fiefdom, but after the 11, 11th century, both of these movement encouraged people to travel. And a long distance travel 
encourage commerce because when you are traveling, you need to stay in a hostel, in a hotel, you need to buy your food, you need to um, stay somewhere, right? And those pilgrimage trip take months. So um, commerce was encouraged by those movement of population as well. So, um, so all those change combined um, <clears throat> start to revive a construction that somehow, somehow reminded people of the lost grandeur of the Romans. Uh, permanent architecture starts to be constructed in the monasteries as well as in the urban area. In the monasteries, they were encouraged by monasticism. And in the cities, they were encouraged by pilgrimage and uh, the movement of population. So uh, timber roof were replaced by masonry roof. You know, we know before 1000, early Christian churches were mostly constructed with timber roof. <coughs> but after the 11th century, a lot of um, churches were constructed with, with um, masonry roof. And that reminded people the lost glory of the Romans. And the people call the, those architecture the Romanesque because they looks Roman. They use arch, they use geometric arch, and they, use, they construct a vault uh, to uh, cover their building. And a later Gothic church uh, start to appear uh, in, the, uh, in the 12th century and the 13th century, first in France and eventually spread all over Europe. So let's first take a look at the um, monasticism, monasteries flourishing after the 11th century. Uh, <clears throat> Nonetheless, the idea of um, monasticism had been in existence uh, way before uh, the turn of the millennium. A plan of ideal monastery had been discovered uh, in the Senghal uh, church in France, and that was from the ninth century. It was drawn on a parchment, um, the ram skin. And on that map, it delineated an ideal uh, plan for a monastery where a self-sufficient community can be constructed so that people can lick, live, people can live a seclude, secluded life, a hermetic lifestyle in the wilderness and not relying on exchange with uh, the outside world. So in this map, located in the center is of course a church, right? And that church is oriented east-west with the altar uh, located at the Eastern end. And interestingly that um, the plan of that church uh, does not look like any later Christian uh, cathedral or church because it has apps on both end. You know, it has the apps on the west end, it has an apse on the east end. And um, so the entrance was from the west end, but after entering the apse, one follow a um, semi-circular passageway to enter the cathedral. Um, so it, in one word, it has greater similarity to the uh, Roman Basilica, where very often you have the exedra, the semet, um, the church and the 
well. The um, Professor, you lagged out just for like one minute. Um, you're muted right now. <clears throat> All right. Um... Uh, can someone tell me if you hear me uh, talking about the layout of the church in the... Uh... Uh, yeah, you lagged out like one minute ago. Okay. okay. All right. That's good. That's good. So, all right. Um, let's see. All right. So we are, we are still recording. That is, that is good. I think we're still recording. Okay, good. Thank you. So, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so basically we were talking about the um, the church. All right, so here we have the church, the abbot's house, who have direct access to this, the heart of the church. And in the, this ideal plan, the north, northern part, the area to the north of the church are the residential area. So we have the Doctor, Abbot's house. We can't see your yes. screen. We can't uh, see your screen. You, you, you can't see my screen. How about now? Is that better? Can you see me? Uh, I can't see anything. Um, I think we have to make you the host again. All right. Um, so let's let me um, let me just uh, stop. Let me just uh, let me just uh, stop this recording and start a new section. Um, 